to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. Ellie Morose joins me today, which is a very special thing for me because I love doing interviews with designers who I know from direct experience are excellent business people. Ellie is another talented designer and astute businesswoman who we are very fortunate to work with at Window Works doing the window treatments for her projects. Ellie's passion for interiors started in the fashion world after graduating from Cornell University She enjoyed several years of internships in ready-to-wear and jewelry design, merchandising, and public relations. And finally, her love of all things beautiful brought her into interior decor. It was a natural transition for her because as her husband's residential and remodeling business, Michael Robert Construction, began to grow, his clients would always ask Ellie for her help in choosing finishes for everything, from countertops to doorknobs and eventually the furnishings that would fill their new home. From there, a husband and wife design build team grew. And from there, a boutique interior design firm was born as well. Today, Ellie and I talk about her niche, which is not a design style or a particular type of client. Get this, it is a town, her town, the town that she and her husband grew up in, that they fell in love in, and that they raised their two small boys in. And we also pick apart the sticky conversations that you can have with your clients and your vendors when things don't go as planned. Ellie has appeared with George Oliphant in several episodes of his show, George to the Rescue, on NBC since 2015 as the on-air talent who helps families in need create beautiful spaces that not only improve the quality of their homes, but also the quality of their lives. Ellie is a fun, smart lady. You're in for a treat. Be sure to check out our show's sponsor when the show is done, article.com. If you are looking for clean mid-century lines for a current project and you need sofas, chairs, office furniture, or outdoor furniture, head over to welldesigned.article.com and open your trade account today. Their To The Trade department is headed by and run by interior designers so they know your language and your needs. Go to welldesigned.article.com and see for yourself. All right, here is my conversation with Ellie. Hey, Ellie, thank you so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hey, Luann, how are you? I am great, and I'm excited to have you on the show today. Uh, First of all, I just think the world of you, Ellie, as we have been doing some work with you uh, through doing some projects with you at Window Works and doing your draperies, I have to say it is so abundantly clear what a tight ship that you run, and (laughs) I am loving it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's so nice of you to notice. Now, it you know what it is? It's noticeable. That's the thing. It really truly is, Ellie. I mean, you um I, I don't I it there's just a level of professionalism that you are exhibiting in your conversation and in the way the project, you know, flows through and and you know, you know, you know I'm not even the one handling your projects. Like Kimberly <laughs> is handling your projects and I'm seeing it and I'm just so excited and I'm so impressed by you. So that's Thank you. awesome. Thank you. And I'm impressed by Kimberly, too. She's doing a great job. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. I'm not surprised, but I'm happy to hear it. (laughs) (laughs) So so here's the thing, Ellie. There's a lot going on with you in your life and your career and your profession here. Um, I think the thing that I would love to start off with is let's talk about 
your experience with George to the rescue for sure. some people, because we are reaching people all over this globe, literally with this <laughs> podcast. Um, tell us a little bit about what George to the rescue is and what your involvement has been with it. Sure. Yeah. So George to the Rescue is a 30 minute show. It airs on local NBC channels, although I do think it reaches throughout the country um, at different times. Mm. It's in the morning. Um, it's a very feel good show and it's real. So what happens is families write in about some kind of hardship, whether it be a health hardship, a monetary hardship um, and something that they think a home improvement might help them with. And George and his team come in and we just do whatever we can in their home to make their life better. Some kind of a renovation, some kind of an interior design. Um, and it's a big surprise in the end. And it's, it's a really, it's a feel good show and it's all based off of donations and, um, just kindness. It's really, it's, it's, I've watched a few episodes now since learning about it through you and getting ready to, uh, interview you. So even, and it's so funny because I've, I've done this before when I interviewed. A matter of fact, you know Jenny Madden and her yes. husband, right? <laughs> we went to high school together, Jenny and I. I thought that was so bizarre when I found that out. I'm like, wait a minute. This is like two worlds colliding here, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. And, yeah. And so the same thing, even though I know you, I still research you, right? Because like with Jenny, I found out things that I didn't know. And then today when I was getting ready to interview you, I, I knew about the George to the Rescue. But where I was going was when I started to watch through some of the uh, uh, episodes on YouTube, but then I noticed that Marlena Teich has done it, which she's a previous podcast uh, ho guest yeah. here too. So it's like, it's such a small world, the design it world. Is. It's a little crazy pants. How it's like, it's oh wait, you know, <laughs> you know him. Right. It's a small, fabulous world. It is, it really is. So, okay, so I love that. And I really did love uh, watching the episodes and seeing the, 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 the thing. I, I am always, I have to say, I everybody knows that I'm, I'm not interested in, I don't want to talk about the design and where the mirrors go and how, you know, what the scale is and all that. But I am always truthfully in awe at watching what you guys are capable of doing. And some of those before and afters were just like, how did she think of that? <laughs> <laughs> so. Right, right. Well, it's, it's, it's extra fun because the, the client, in this case, the family, has really no say in the design. Um, although we do do a little bit of pre-show interview with them to find out their likes, dislikes, what they need. But we really get full creative control, which gives us a lot of power. Oh, so that's a layer that is is interesting so yeah. you don't have to sit there and say you know how about this lamp or this lamp and them say I like this one you're like eh, wrong lamp right right right, <laughs> right. Like, and if I had a nickel for every client who told me like you know if they don't have a say and it comes out that great maybe I should just give you full creative control oh. and come back in a couple months <laughs> right, but then do they don't do it really right well. but then it doesn't quite happen that way but it's true <laughs> and you're like you 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 think to yourself yes go ahead go just give me the keys give me your check Book, I'll be fine. Yeah, the budget. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because you know, designers have that like full picture in mind the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, it's really the the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. um, and so it gets tricky when you have to, you know, okay, like you said, every last lampshade. But yes, yeah. it's <laughs> funny. I recently was interviewing somebody, and I'm going to confused whether it was Judith Taylor or Kim Hager and I think it was one of those and we were talking about tips for newer designers and one of the things that she said looking back on her career is that she would never do go back to going and she suggests that even as a newer designer that you don't deliver things as they come in never see never. see Right. And that what made Never. me think about that is because you were just saying it's the it's the whole together. So she, her conversation was, you know, you bring in the the green rug and the client is like, that's a little green. And yes. but as a designer, you're like, not until the other things get here. When everything else gets here, it'll be fine. Right. Totally. Investing in a receiver, a receiving warehouse where they hold all of your goods until you're ready for it the majority install is the best money you will invest. Mm. It sounds like it's expensive, um, but really it's so worth it. Cause just like you said, nobody wants to see that green rug by itself. <laughs> it will look like a big green monster. Like you need to see the whole, you know, the green on the trim and the 
beautiful window, you know, treatment and all of that. You got to see the, the full picture and you can't get that until multiple items are delivered. Exactly. So now talk a little, I was going to go all into the TV thing, but you just went to something very actionable <laughs> and I have to go here. So think about that. Like in the beginning, were you able to stand in your space and say, no, I'm pulling things or is it a lesson learned for you after the fact as well, Ellie? Uh, what do you mean? As far as the, in the beginning, did you like from starting scratch as a baby designer, mm-hmm. did you keep things in receivership or even in your own garage uh, until yeah. you delivered or was it a lesson learned for you hindsight as well? It was a lesson learned. Luckily, it was a short lesson um, and ended up fine. I had one of my first clients, we installed like a, it was a, a chest, like a big like a, a, a dresser kind of a thing. It was in a family room and I let her accept the delivery on her own. Um, and I get a call from her like, okay, it's too big. It doesn't fit. It looks weird. It's by, you know, so I get there and I was like, just give me, give me five minutes. It's going to look great. And so I just positioned it better. I pulled in the little area rug that she had from someplace. I, I brought some accessories with me and put it on and just stepped back and like she was so relieved. <laughs> so, I mean, even though that was just one piece, that's the other important thing. I think a designer needs to be there mm. for any kind of installation or delivery, whether it's the designer or the assistant or whoever. You need to be there and and, and walk them through where it goes and how to set it up because when it just plops down there in the middle of the wall, it will look like a stranger in that room. Right. And the thing is, too, is you were able to coordinate it all so that she said, oh, I'm relieved it looks amazing. But I've been around the bush a time or two with clients, and some clients will just have a negative outlook and be like, well, you made it look better, but it actually is too big, which is illogical, right? It's completely logical. I couldn't make it look better if it's too big. But they almost could have the feeling of you're just trying to make it look good. And so – the fact is that you're right. If it gets delivered and you do your magic to the whole thing, there's no – the client feeling like you're stuffing a square peg down a round hole. Round that hole. it is right. there, right? Okay. Right. Okay. So you had that happen once and you said, and oh, that's not happening again. And then, again, take me a little bit further. When you start out in your firm – so we're going back to the beginning now, Ellie, and you now learn this lesson and – I guess you have to build in the fees for the receivership. Did you ever have in the beginning clients say, well, why do I have to pay to store everything? Just deliver it to me when it comes. Like, how did you go overcome that? Yes, yes, definitely, especially in the world now of free shipping or $99 shipping for the whole room, you know, the kind of thing they see in retail. Yeah, it's it's definitely a conversation and it's definitely an explanation and that's something that I lay out to my clients in the beginning when I present them with my my contract um or letter of agreement because it's important that they understand that my receiver is not only receiving, they're unpacking, they're inspecting, they're making any kind of small adjustment that needs to be made. Then they're going to discard of all of that packaging, (laughs) which people don't think about how much cardboard and styrofoam pieces and things there are. And then they're going to deliver it and help us place it in the right spot. So once you explain to them how many steps really go into that, they, I think they understand those fees a little bit. Um, and I think it's just about setting expectations right in the beginning. When we talk about their budget, I make sure that they know to include an extra, whatever it might be for the delivery. And so what I love about this, Ellie, is that you said the one thing right there, setting expectations. So it's a conversation at the beginning before they've signed the contract because yes. somebody doesn't want to do it. Well, they don't have to do it, but that doesn't exactly. mean you're going to change, right? And the other thing that I love that you you just went right into was you expressed the value of the receivership. You didn't just say the receivership is an extra 10% on the total project and you have to have it because that's the way I do things. You right. said here's and you and I find the same thing. I often counsel the the people that work for me at Window Works. I always say, when you're going to do something for somebody, make sure they understand all the steps that it takes to get that done. Because if we're doing our job right, we're making it look easy. All right? We're making it feel easy. But sometimes when somebody pushes back on price, they are actually 
either forgetting or not having any idea of the scope of all the things that we do to make it look easy. And so that's, that's a right. perfect example, the receivership, just like you said, the cardboard, the carding, the, how about all the like, little popcorn crap in your house? Who the yeah. heck wants that? Right? What are you going to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you do acknowledge that for a newer designer starting out that the conversation could be a little tricky and that the way to get around it is to be very clear on what you're delivering but to have the conversation prior to contract so that if somebody if you if you haven't met the client yet that will pull the trigger on that budget then you don't they don't have to be your client Exactly. Absolutely. And you said it before, in the very beginning, I did hoard those accessories and lamps and et cetera in my garage or in my studio <laughs> if I didn't want to go through the steps of a receivership in the very beginning. Um, but whatever it is, you just it's so valuable to deliver all at once for sure. Okay. So when you did have to, in the beginning, sometimes collect them all at your own place, then did you, you did the, all of the unpacking probably or help from mm -hmm. whoever, but then did you just hire a, a service to come and make the delivery in one day, whatever handyman people or whatever those resources yep. are? Yep, exactly. Right, 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 right. Okay. So so there's value in doing it, and we've been told it more than a couple of times. I do think it's probably very difficult for a, a lesser experienced designer to insist on it because sometimes, yep. you know, you're only doing four or five pieces, and it sort of feels like why wait? But, the you know, if I guess what it is is the first time you get burned and somebody actually, <laughs> you know, would, no matter how much you accessorize that chest, if they're just standing there telling you it looks too big, then you may not do it again that way, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So a, a little back to the George to the rescue. You have been asked multiple times to do the George to the rescue show. And what that says to me is that you're reliable, that you are somebody that probably comes in, does things on time, uh, on budget, even if it is all donated. I'm sure there are <laughs> budgetary constraints there because there's no shortage of interior designers in this world, especially in the New York, New Jersey area here. So what do you think you're bringing to the table, Ellie, that it's created this relationship where you've been invited more than a few times to do the show? Yeah, I feel very fortunate um, and honored that they ask us over and over again. And I say us because they've asked me and my husband, Mike, mm -hmm. who is a general contractor and who, you know, we, him and I work so well together. And I think that is what attracts them to us. Um, they love our, A, our chemistry on camera. It never hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and B, our process is so much more streamlined than the typical designer and contractor relationship. Um, they like that the conversation continues for us after we're done filming, after we're, we leave the job site. It continues at home, at the dinner table, right. or in the office. Um, so I think that makes us very efficient. I think it makes us, um, like you said, on time. And the process is just so much easier for them and as a result for the client. Um, whether it be this family on TV or a real life client. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what keeps them coming back to us. Okay. And the thing about it is, is that you and Mike have two separate companies. You have Ellie Moreau's designs and he has Michael Robert construction and you do do projects together, but the majority of your projects, I understand, are not necessarily together, that there are lots of them and they're big ticket ones that are together, but you, the, you most of your projects are separate. Yep, that's exactly right. So um, most of the majority of my projects are mostly interiors, lots of furniture and soft finishes, um, and they are my own clients. But uh, some of them are clients of Mike's who really just want some help, some guidelines. They want construction help. Mm -hmm. They want help picking finishes. They want help room planning. Um, they need color schemes. And then we will work after that into the furniture and, and soft finishings and things. So um, really, our businesses complement each other so nicely. Um, and there are clients who want that one-stop shop. But, you know, there are other clients who call me and already have a contractor mm -hmm. um, or they call me and it's not a huge project, something that Mike would take on. So I bring in a smaller subcontractor or suggest to them that they find their own smaller general contractor. And likewise, there are people who come to Mike and already have a designer on board. And that is totally fine and totally cool. And we're both, you know, we're 
open and amenable to working with other professionals. That's nice because it keeps all doors open. And exactly. yeah, that's, that's actually pretty smart on your part because you could see if it, if you had the outlook of the other where, no, if you're going to work with, uh, you know, Michael Robert Construction, then you have to use my wife, Ellie Moreau's Designs. And that's like silliness, right? right? Okay. No, we would never, never impose that on someone. And we have so many fantastic local designers um, that Mike has worked with. And I truly believe it's collaborative. This is a small town, <laughs> mm -hmm. but there is enough work to go around. Everyone has their own client, their own clientele, their own style. Um, and I love to hear about Mike's experience with these other designers. And I love to talk to the other designers about their experience <laughs> with Mike. <laughs> you know, so it's all, it's all very interesting. And we have a very open door policy. Yeah. You really are a rare person, Ellie. I have to say, you really, <laughs> no, you, I mean, you are, you're just very, um, I usually save this for the end of the interview, the big compliment, but I have to tell you, I just love your personality. I really, really do. You have such a great outlook on things, just the way you describe that. I love to hear Mike tell me about how he works with other designers. And, and what I heard it is it not like the gossip. I want to, you, I know what you're doing. Is there a process that she does or he does that's better? Is there something I can learn from that? I know that that's the end of that sentence because I know you and I can exactly. hear it in you. Yes. Can you hear me blushing? <laughs> This headset. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Uh, I, well, you know, it's just it's well deserved, though. I mean, it's it's Thank just you. yeah, definitely. So there's 90 things that I have to go down the road with okay. you on, and I'm like, my head is spinning because you, I, I always find something of tremendous value to pull out of every guest, and that's what I love doing. But Ellie, I'm looking at my list here for you. Number one, we have the whole that whole thing, that whole discussion about the collaboration between the contractor and the designer. We also have have, which I just want to take a minute to go down. You said it's a small town, but there's a lot of designers here and you each, you have your own look, whether every one of them does or not. You have the ultimate niche here. Now, you know, because you listen to the show that we talk about niching ad nauseum, okay, because yeah. it's so powerful and so valuable to do. But you have niched so far in that you literally are working or your goal is to work in one city, in the city of <laughs> Westfield, New Jersey. And furthermore, your, your look is modern traditional. So you're not even like, I will work within the six mile border of Westfield, but if you want Tuscan or you want mid-century, I'm your girl. So talk to us about that because it is working for you in spades, but that is for most other designers would be crazy pants. They'd say, wait, I don't cross the city border. That's insanity. <laughs> it is crazy, but you know, this is a a fantastic town. Mike and I both grew up here. Our roots are really deep here in Westfield. And Word of mouth here is so powerful, for better or worse. You know, you do a great job, yes. everybody will know about it. <laughs> if you do something wrong, everybody will know about it, you know? So it, that drives you to do your best work, first of all. Second of all, people talk and they love to show off things that they're proud of. So I found that, you know, I did one job, maybe my first job, let's say, and, and their friends came over for coffee to see the room. And then next thing I know, those two friends are calling me. And something that I've learned is not to say no, though. So like, you're right, I really try to only work in Westfield. <laughs> let's say somebody from, you know, Mountain Short Hills, Hills or something. Short right? Hills. Oh, God, Short Hills, that's like a full 15 minutes. I don't know about <laughs> I won't say flat out no. I'll never say flat out no because I do think that 90% of life is just showing up okay. basically. So I will always take the call. I will always talk to them um, and I'll listen to what they need. I probably won't travel <laughs> to Short Hills, but you never know. For the right client, um, it's possible. But do I just have to tell people this is like not traveling from you know eighty <laughs> fifth Street on Third Avenue to Twenty Third Street? You know what I mean? Like this is like ridiculous how close these towns are. And she's like, "Well, I'll take the call. I'm not quite sure I'll take the job, but I'll take but the call." It's also about knowing what you can take on, right? Yes. So like I could take it all on, but I'll be super stressed. My work will suffer, and the clients will suffer. Mm. So I'd rather take on fewer jobs and stay smaller. Mm. Um, I just recently hired a full-time employee and it's been fantastic. 
I still have to turn jobs down. And that doesn't mean in my mind that I should go hire another employee right this second. Um, I'd rather just kind of focus and make those the best jobs and make them profitable. So that's part of the mentality too with staying close and keeping a small work radius. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I understand from a personal standpoint. So we just discussed how the two of you have grown up in this town, but you also have two little boys that you are also raising too that are six and eight years old. So from a practical personal standpoint, point, you could theoretically be on a job site, pick one up at, you know, day camp and take the other one to piano and soccer or whatever. But that's not actually the driver of the reasoning behind it. The driver of the reasoning behind it is that it just simply is your choice to keep building deeper and deeper roots in Westfield. Is that more what it is? Yes, it is. Yeah. And I, I feel like I really understand the clientele here, not just having lived here, you know, for 12 years, but actually for my entire life. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I I understand the homes here. I understand like when they were built, how they were built, what the style is like. Um, And so for me, that's a comfort Mm -hmm. is being able to understand that. And I think that translates into my designs and into understanding what the client wants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we're joking a little bit about that, (laughs) but do you actually, when was, we're joking, but is it like, well, I actually did last year have a client in Mountainside or, or is it, you know, I, I used to, but I can't remember the last time. How, how, how strict are you on that? No, I've never, I never had a client in Mountainside. (laughs) (laughs) So I did recently start um, offering a different kind of a service that I call design therapy, which is, which is more of like an hourly consulting business. And I did recently take a client in Summit on because I know it won't be endless trips to Summit. It's more of a controlled hourly project. Um, So those kind of projects, and that's part of me also not saying no, I will offer them a different solution if they really want to work with me. Um, So you're not looking to take a full service on Summit, which is on the border of Westfield, like like literally (laughs) like going from 85th Street to 80th Street. I will will never say never to anything, but (laughs) no. (laughs) Okay. And and so, and and again, we're, we're laughing about it, and I am laughing about it, but in there is a very true commitment to your niche. You are establishing establishing yourself as the premier knowledgeable interior design firm on Westfield, its community, its construction, its aesthetic. It's, it's, it, that's what you're doing. You're, I mean, I, what I'm going to really is going to be insane is another Forget 10 years from now, 20, 25, 30 years from now, you are going to have such a reputation in this community. <laughs> You're going to be that like old lady in design in Westfield. It's going to be amazing. Hashtag Except goals, you, Luann. Right, right. <laughs> Except that you're still going to be a CrossFitter at probably 90. And so you'll be still kicking butt. <laughs> I will still move that chest if I need to. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, so when you think about leaning into a niche like that, now, and I did mention briefly that you have the particular aesthetic of modern traditional. You can explain to us what that means to you. But the fact is, is that you have a dual thing going on. It's not only the geography, but it's a particular look. You're not out there doing right. shabby chic. If somebody wants that, even if they're in Westfield, you're going to say, I'm not your girl. Right, right. Or I will just direct them kind of to my portfolio or to my Instagram feed and say, is this the right look for you? I do say that I will say I do tailor my style to each client. I don't think I've ever had two clients who I'd categorize as the exact same style. Um, And I think I am capable of kind of designing in lots of different styles, but Mm -hmm. they all in the end kind of have that layered, approachable, texture full. (laughs) It's not a word. (laughs) Texture (laughs) filled. (laughs) Um, That is truly me. And Mm -hmm. that is, that was one of my big goals this year for myself was to really think, like reach deep down and say, does this project represent me? Mm -hmm. And and what I want to do. And that's actually something that I took away from Raquel Langworthy, who I know you've seen, um, a photographer that I respect and I use. And she said, I had all these projects I wanted to photograph. And she was so patient with me and sat down and, and listened to me talk about each one. And she's just said, listen, just shoot the ones that you shoot, the ones that you want to get in the future, shoot the ones that are representative of the projects that you want to get. 
Um, and that that hit home with me. And so mm -hmm. I try to do that. I try to design projects that are representative of me and representative of the projects that I would like to get in the future. Right, right. We've had others on the show. Raquel, definitely awesome episode. She is the photographer here in the area. And um, she did do a great job of explaining how she collaborates with the photog with the designer, just as you just mm -hmm. described, and helps to bring out the best in what's going to be to come of the of the for the portfolio. But we've had others express the same thing. If your entire website is filled with, you know, I'm just going to say Tuscan again because I don't know what else to say. <laughs> And you don't want to do Tuscan. You have to pull the Tuscan down, no matter right. how beautiful objectively that Tuscan design is. If it's not right. making your heart sing to do it, you got to just pull it down. Right? right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So, and so you had this, this moment in this past year of this is where I'm going to step in and I'm going to put the face forward and attract this type of client. You, I don't know if you heard the show with studio Thomas also, she did the same thing. She had over 11 or 16,000 followers on Instagram and wow. her, yes. And her Instagram feed was all the projects that she done, all the tech, like you said, you're completely capable of all different looks. And she said, this is the look that I want to do. And she wiped her entire feed out and started over again with wow. just the looks and the projects, just like you discussed with Raquel, said, put That's up fantastic. what you want to attract. Yeah. And then, you know what she said? Six months later, she couldn't, you know, the doors are banging down. Amazing. Yeah. So, Amazing. so I have these conversations over and over again with different people as they come up because I, two things, I know that it's hard to visualize wiping out your entire portfolio because you're, you're proud of your portfolio. No matter if it's a design that you is your first choice or not, you've, you've probably done a terrific job and your client was happy. So it's mm -hmm. hard to do that. Right. And it, right. when, once you've done it and you've stepped through the fire, you've done it, Kirsten has done it, you know, different people have done it. It's sort of like, easy to say, yeah, I did it. It's great. But when you're th contemplating doing it, it's totally, you need that support that like other people did it. And it was, it was the best thing, not just, it was okay. It was the best thing that they did. Right. 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 And that, I think that only comes with a little bit of time and experience because mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. need that confidence for sure. Right, right, right. Exactly. So that's awesome. So you have two niches that you have stepped into here and you really just own it. And I, anytime I talk to somebody that has had the courage and the combination of experience, as you mentioned, to fully own their niche, there always is a joy in their voice because they're so <laughs> happy with their work now. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Keep it simple. Right. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Exactly. So and so this design therapy thing in Summit, this this means that you're going to cross the border there and do a certain finite thing, but you're not going to take a full on reno project there. You're that's just crazy pants. <laughs> For now. Yeah. For now. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the other thing that I want, I really want to take advantage of why I have you with us today here, Ellie, is this conversation about working with the contractors and the construction firms and the subcontractors, because you have the unique position of working not only with your husband side by side, but still, you know, at the same time, as we said, you are, will do projects with other contractors, but I can imagine that when things go wrong, whether it's when you're working with your husband's firm or another for other firms, there's probably a part of you that has that construction guy's back because you see the other side of it, having the relationship there with your husband. And I have a, a, a very dear listener, Peggy Morgans, who I absolutely adore. She came to my birthday party for the podcast in February, drove down from Rochester, New York, all the way down to be here. And um, her business is actually called Window Works, too. Isn't that funny? Huh. <laughs> I know, right? Um, but she emailed me a couple of weeks ago, and she asked me if I would bring up this question. How do you handle it? What are some things to think about when things go wrong on a project, and particular when things go wrong with subcontractors? And so talk to us a little bit about this 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 tightrope of this relationship from the designer to the GC or the designer to the subcontractor or whatever it might be. Sure. Yeah. I have so many thoughts on that. Mm. Um, 
I think what is precedent is that you need to think of yourself as a team. You have to have a united front. It's nobody's best look when you start pointing fingers. Mm. Um, you know, things things happen. As we like to say, things are handmade, <laughs> basically, <laughs> right? Um, you can you can measure, you can you can discuss and email all you want, but things will happen. And I think the most important thing is that you and your subcontractor keep a united front, and you you need to communicate with your client, but you also need to remember that you are in a luxury business, basically. You are in a service business. So you need to make this as painless as possible for your client. There's no reason to drag them <laughs> through the mud explaining every every turn that went wrong, whether it be your fault, the subcontractor's fault, whoever it might be. You need to face them with, with a way to fix it basically. So whether that means having a private conversation with that subcontractor and rehashing, you know, what happened, let's just get it fixed. What, what can we do to get this fixed and get it done right? Um, I really think that's the most important thing. Mm. What you're saying in there is two things I'm hearing is work on the resolution. Forget the drama. Like right. leave the drama up, uh, aside and leave the drama aside with the contractor and work to the resolution. But more importantly, what you're saying is there's no point in standing there and having this whole conversation with the client, which throws the contractor under the bus and, right. and he this or she that and this is that and oh my God, they're horrible. <laughs> it's a waste of time. It is a waste of time. It's not productive, right? right? It's not no, productive. it's not productive. Mm -mm. It only creates more issues and more distrust, I mm -hmm. think. So I get that. So so the thing is, is to be respectful and work to solution. But how about when we actually have a disagreement or a conflict with the contractor? So you sound a lot like me. I get right to the bare facts and it's sort of like I don't want to go down all that road of all this. He said, she said, let's just figure out the solution. But there are times when we deal with people on the other end of that, that want all the drama. It could be the contractor. It could be the, well, you said this in the email that and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. Tell us your tactics and your tools and your things for overcoming. Right. So I, I do make sure that everything is really well documented. I try to never, um, discuss things over text with either a client or a subcontractor. Um, things are done through email. Things are done through purchase orders. Um, and I have record of all of those things. So if we have to get down to brass tacks, um, we can, and we have documentation. And listen, I'm not going to say that I will never be in the wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason I think you should never just throw someone under the bus or point fingers because you could easily be on the other side of that bus. <laughs> you might you know? have forgotten some. That's totally right. possible. And it may happen someday too. And so you have to ask yourself, is this someone that I want to continue working with and continue the working relationship with? And if it is, then I think you need to get to the bottom of it when it needs to, you know, when it comes down to who has to pay for what, if something has to be redone, mm -hmm. then really you need to, to look at your documentation. But in the end, I think the answer is just get it fixed, get it done, make your client happy, um, and keep your vendor relationships good and strong. That was another goal of mine for this year was really to whittle down my vendor relationships and strengthen them. Right, 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 right. Well, there's a couple of things you started with get your things in order from the beginning. Right. That That's the beginning of everything. I, I have to say, on a regular basis, when there is a mistake, a problem, whether it's just in-house on our part or it involves another trade or involves directly with our client, when there is a mistake or a problem, you can almost always track it to a place where you drop the ball. Right. I mean, it, it's just so true. And so the thing about it is, is, is if that you approach it with some preparation and some clarity and you're responsible. I don't know, Elle, you don't, you have, you are locked down. I said that at the beginning, working <laughs> with you is very, very nice, but you would be surprised at some of the hello, quote unquote, what some designers thinks are a purchase order. Right. And, and, and revisions happen and then we don't get notified of them. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing. It sounds like to me that you are consciously from the beginning, making an effort to keep all the ducks in a row so that the conversation at the moment of conflict can be get to resolution. But 
if somebody's going to press somebody's back against the wall, then you're going to be able to bring out all your documentation and say, you see here, this third email, I told you to change it to sideways, yep. whatever it is. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My email, I, my searchable email is a gold mine for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I never delete anything. I know. Well, and I have to say, I'm just going to take a minute to give a shout out to my Doma studio here, my, one of my show sponsors. And I'm a broken record with this. It's one of the reasons that I love my Doma studio. There's a lot of things for your business as a designer that it's terrific and it helps you do things faster, easier, quicker, yada, yada. But I'm a broken record. I love that all of the communication with the designer and me as the window treatment person is in that project. So I don't even have to do the searchable email if I'm working with a designer who uses my Doma Studio. Whereas everybody else, I do do that, Ellie. I, if, if you place a drapery order with me, when I finally get your purchase order, before I start to now make my documentation to have the work orders done at the workroom, I will literally search every email correspondence that we have had with you that has that side marks name on it mm -hmm. because sometimes the purchase orders don't get changed but yep there's that email from four months ago and i you know forgot that the lead edge trim was changed to two inches in instead of one inch you know mm -hmm. and so but that's what i do love about my doma i don't have to go outside of that project and that is very exciting for me valuable yes makes my life easier <laughs> yeah so so the thing is so you know it's it sounds when it really does go bad though okay so mm -hmm. what would you say have you been in a situation though with probably not your husband but other <laughs> contractors um where you actually were able to show that contractor that in fact you had sent them updated information and they did not uh execute whatever it was the tile layout the whatever it was according to your specifications and it is not something that you or your client could live with and maybe it is a big expense have you had the situation where the sub would not stand up and do the right thing i have to tell you i've been in that situation um but i've been fortunate or whatever you want to call it enough that it has been resolved um so yeah, there, I mean, there was one issue I had where we did a custom piece of furniture. Um, it was a long banquette that had to fit um, underneath a dining table. It had a lot of legs on it. The dining table also had legs. There was some concern about whether the legs would butt up to the other legs and mm. it would easily slide under. Um, but we hashed it out and, and figured it out. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it was, I mean, it was fine. It ended up fine. So I don't know if it's good fortune. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's just luck. Um, but really I haven't been in a terrible situation like that. Um, I think it, it has to do with just constantly checking up with the subs, doing site visits, doing walkthroughs. It's so valuable. Like you can go back and forth on email all day long, but actually being on site and walking through with those, with the client and, or the subcontractor, that is so valuable. Absolutely right. Yeah, it's just real time walking in. Exactly. We talked yeah. yesterday or three days ago about which way the tile was going to go, but today I'm going to look at it while you're laying it. That's it, because your horizontal might not be their horizontal. <laughs> it's the yeah. truth. It's the yeah. truth. And but but I will say that if if it does happen to me tomorrow, I think that the best way to deal with it is just head on, like you said, just kind of um, figure out the solution mm -hmm. and. And, and just and keep a unified front as much as you can in front of your client. I like that. Keep a unified front as much as you can in front of your client. And That's it's great. Parenting, right? It's kind of like parenting. In yes, front of right. Your <laughs> Good point. <laughs> we don't throw daddy under the bus in front of the kids. We wait till later at night. <laughs> exactly. Behind closed doors, just the same as their subcontractors. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, have you had situations, Ellie, where? A, a sub has done something. I, I recall when we built our house many, many years ago, and my husband really wanted, now, like, you know, this was in 1999, so the, tie, the style then was to have the backsplash pattern on the 
the diagonal on the diamond uh-huh. as opposed to straight. So yep. full, you know, like, you know, you know, exclusion for what's gone the wayside in style. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I happen to, like you said, we were on, we were basically overseeing the house ourselves. We were not working with a, a designer to do it. And so I walked in one day and they were installing the backsplash and it was all on the straight. And I wasn't emotionally attached to it personally. I was like, whatever. And, right. but I called my husband. I was like, oh, the tile's in, it's done, and it's all straight. I think you wanted it. And he just, he he would not, he, it, in, in that situation, the contractor was good, owned up to it. The paperwork all said the diamond. and But he was not willing to say, okay, we'll keep it on the straight. He truly wanted it on mm. the diamond. Have you had situations mm-hmm. where you've gone in, it's been done opposite of the way you've specified it, and you just thought to yourself, it's fine. I'll speak yep. to my client about it. Or do you always go, not what I asked for, buddy, pull it out? Nope, I'm more of of the previous. Like I will always think about the design as a whole and say, is this going to impact the design is this going to be a major inconvenience? Will me or the client notice this in a year from now when they're just in their space enjoying it? And if the answer is yes to any of those, then I might call the contractor back and really dig my heels in no matter what the cost is, no matter what the time setback is too. Mm -hmm. You have to think about being on time and on schedule. Like Mm -hmm. will, will retiling that backsplash really, will it's, you know, will it mess up your, your countertop install or your plumbing or whatever it might be. Um, But yeah, I mean, like just recently we tiled, we're, we're building a house for ourselves right now. <laughs> and so we tiled our mudroom floor and I picked this beautiful marble tile and I, I knew it could possibly, you know, look a little dingy down the road. So I chose a darker grout. Um, and sure enough, I came in and it was looked insanely beautiful, but it had this light grout in there. Mm. And that's just, that's not what I asked for. That's not what I spec. The, you know, the sheet uh, was right hanging up on the wall, showing oh. the tile pattern. <laughs> It's hanging right cetera, there, et cetera, no less. Et cetera. And you know what? It happens. That's crazy. <laughs> Literally, sheet happens. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I asked myself, like, and now this, there's a ton of grout, grout joints here. I know they make something where you can stain the grout so that it's darker. You know, I know that you, they could, you know, chisel it all out and redo it. But I asked myself, is it worth the delay? Is it worth the the manpower? Um, even if they're not going to charge us for changing it, is it worth it? Um, and my answer to myself is no, because if it does get dingy, then at that point we'll readdress it. Right. You know, we'll, we'll, then we'll do the grout stain or whatever it might be to make it more unified in a darker grout. But yeah, I mean, it happens and you have to ask yourself and it, really you have to ask your client if it's going to really impact the way they feel when they're in that room. So let me ask you a question. I think that my experience in coaching younger interior designers, I always say younger and what I mean is newer, is that they sometimes mistakenly feel if they have designed it a certain way, then that's the way it has to be. It's that way or the vision is compromised, okay? And what I'm hearing from you is that you take an assessment, you take a value judgment on the whole thing. And what you've said very clearly is if the entire vision is compromised, then it has to be changed. But if you're really honest and you look around and you think yada, yada, this could be fine, who's going to notice this? It really, I could could have done it this way and I did it that way, la, la, la. But so let's say, first of all, I love that. So I'm just clarifying (laughs) that just because you designed it one way doesn't mean it's the only way and you could have fantastically designed it another way and (laughs) don't go all diva on everybody, right? Exactly. Okay, so that's one thing. But how about now, say this tile floor that you just described in the mudroom was not for your own home, Ellie, but was for a client. And what I wonder is when you bring it to the client and you I can hear you that you would honestly say, look, we're, we, I, the drawing is there. The sheet was there. Everything was there. I can ask them to pull it up. It's going to put time off the schedule. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. If your client looks at you and says, okay, if you really believe it looks just as well, I'm happy to do it. Is the next sentence from the client, but do I get a discount from the tile guy? Like, am I going to get a compensation for this? Or how do you handle that? Um, I think it'll depend on the situation and I I will always say, I don't know, but I'll find out. And I, I like to step away from the situation, um, and do my own thinking Mm -hmm. and speak to the, to the subcontractor and find out what that means. Um, 
I I don't know. I, I think if it if it really takes away from the value, um, then yeah, maybe they are entitled. Um, but maybe then we give the the subcontractor the opportunity to fix it. Right. Um, I think we just need to be transparent and open and clear in as much as possible Mm -hmm. um, and just say, I don't know, let me talk to them about it. Right, right. I mean, my thing is for me personally, I don't, I think there's two times in 36 years where we have given money back rather than fix a mistake. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and I also have to say, because our mistakes are as hard as it is to fix a window treatment mistake, it's a whole lot easier than fixing a tile mistake. Right. 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 Okay. So there's a difference from uh, industry to industry. However, when, like, I have to say, I think that is a higher level of skills for negotiation because I think, if you looking at me, if you're my interior designer and you're looking at me and saying, look, this grout actually looks beautiful. I just picked a darker grout. So five years from now, when it starts to get dirty, life mm-hmm. didn't make you crazy, but mm-hmm. it looks beautiful to me. That's not, Hey, and give me, you know, get me $200 off from the contractor. That's like, okay, it looks beautiful. Move on. But I know that that's not everybody's way of thinking. Some clients do push back if it's not what it is. And those are tough conversations until you're a little bit more skilled in business. Don't you agree? I agree. I yeah. do agree. Yeah. Um, but I think that in those scenarios, you do want the client to be happy. And Mm. if it's easy to say, I suppose, but if it is a $200 credit towards their next invoice that they want, you really have to think about that, you know, is, is their happiness worth it? And Mm. I think I'd like to think that I would probably just say yes, because Mm -hmm. as you know, my niche is it's small (laughs) town. (laughs) And like I said, if they're not happy, everybody knows about it. And if they are happy, everyone knows about it. So that, you know, maybe I would file that under marketing. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You know, like, you know, you want to make them happy. And if you, you do not want that to be the thing that they remember. Exactly. Exactly. that they felt that they were entitled to some kind of a compensation, and I flat out said no. Right. I, I think that's not good customer service. And and like I said, we are in the service industry. This is a service that we are providing. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they're not happy in the end, you know, like I, I had to return something on Amazon the other day, and they wanted to charge me whatever it was, $6 for the return shipping. And I was like, no. <laughs> and so they graciously were like, no problem. We'll just credit you that. And I'm like, thank you so much. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, I, can I speak to your supervisor to tell them how great you are? <laughs> that's that's awesome. what I'll remember, you yes, know? Yeah. And so I think that's an important lesson in customer service and in business. Right. And I was actually more thinking that in this whole mudroom scenario, that it was the responsibility of the contractor. Because you could look at that contractor because the sheet was right there and say, look, you can spend two weeks of your life ripping this whole thing up and all of the labor and all the materials, or my client is asking for a, a, a discount on this. She's asking for some mm-hmm. sort of a refund. I didn't think it should come from your pocket. My thing is, is I don't like the conversation about giving a refund or a discount on something that the expectation wasn't met. However, mm-hmm. in that situation, if it's clear that your instructions were clear and the contractor made the mistake, then I think it's, I think what you said about customer service is what his opinion should be. I want right. Ellie to be happy as the interior designer that brings me work time after time. And Ellie should know that if she specifies something and she's got it in writing and I mess it mm-hmm. up that I'm either prepared to completely rip that whole mud room up or if her client wants a different compensation of whatever it might be, then I'm going to do it. So um, I remember, as a matter of fact, in the case of the tile in our house, there was not tile at a section over the desk part in the kitchen. And in they, re- I remember them saying, we'll tell you what, we'll give you that whole part, the labor <laughs> and the materials free if you just keep it on the straight. Mm-hmm. And yes, and my husband was like, I really want it on the diagonal. I'm like, sorry, guys, he wants it on the <laughs> diagonal. <laughs> and he's even- 
is he going? It's just, and, and it, we built this, you know, it was 5,000 square foot house. And I have to say, there was like four things that he cared about. And that right. was one of them. And so. Well, then I say, then I say stick to your guns. Yes. If that's right. Important to you and you look back years from now and remember that, yeah. then I think it, it was a decision well, well made. Yeah. He, he just really, he, and he, he's not a jerk. He thought about it. He stood there. He came over, he dropped everything, got up from his desk, came over and looked at it <laughs> and just went, I really don't like it. And I was like, all right, sorry, guys, you got to rip it out. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, it's um, it's tough. I always say that I think that developing the skill set for having the hard conversation, for being able to stand there and calmly discuss a problem, and to understand who has the leverage and wh- where the the tipping points are, and where the negotiation is, and the points are, is very valuable to cultivate on your own as a business person. But also to always, as you said, L, the customer service element is the Mm -hmm. king because you know every happy client tells one or two people every pissed off client tells every person that's ever met yep 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 that's right and that's why I don't leave a mistake in for myself because I can fix it because I have said to people I remember one time back early in business I'll never forget this balloon shade it was a five (laughs) thousand it was forty eight hundred and ninety four dollars this balloon shade and there was a mistake on it and she said said to me, oh, I'll just keep it the way it is. Give me money off. Mm. And I rem- and it didn't look right. It wasn't just a thing where the tile on the straight or the tile on the di- diagonal is right. subjective. There was, I don't recall what there was wrong with it, but there was something wrong with it. And I remember saying the only way that I, ha- I can leave this here is if we also put a sign next to it that says, <laughs> you prefer to have this wrong then Luann at Window Works making it right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, and right. So, well, you take pride in your trade. Well, that's the thing. It was, it, whatever it was, I, we see, I remember how much it cost and I remember what we did, but I don't remember what it was, but I remember looking going, this looks ridiculous. We've made a mistake. I can't leave it here because I can't tell everybody. And there's going to be some people that are going to be savvy that come into your house and think who they're going to ask you who did it, but they're not going to say, Oh, good. Thanks for telling me. I'll never call them. You know? Right. Right. Exactly. (laughs) So I think, but there is a fine line between it literally being not right and just being not what you designed and still beautiful anyway. Right. Yeah. I think, I think I, I, this is something for myself. I just don't take myself that seriously. <laughs> Good for you. I mean, when it when it comes down to it, we're picking beautiful things for your home. Like we're shopping. We're we're making things look pretty. It should be fun and it should be lighthearted. But you're yeah. absolutely right. If something is just not right, right. if it's not constructed well, if it if it's not gonna hold up or something, right. um, or if you just the flat out don't like it. The scale is right. wrong. Yeah, exactly. If it's just not what you ordered, then right. I understand. You gotta right. send it back. Right. Yeah. Well, Kim has what she calls the twenty day rule. I, for me, it's 20 minutes. So the 20 day rule is eh, in 20 days, you won't notice it. Right. It's like right. she says, is it one of the, like you said, is it something right. that I always know I will always walk in and it compromises the entire scope of the project or is it just different than I designed? And so she says in 20 days, will I care about this? And so for me, I'm like in 20 minutes, will I care about this? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> you are efficient. We know this. So there you go. <laughs> I get there a lot quicker. I'm like, Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness so really uh terrific Ellie I really admire you guys I said it uh, together and I've I've met what I have to share with everybody is I've met Ellie and her husband together uh and they uh, they are a great team and you can see the respect in the way that we had some conversations about motorization for the window treatments for your own home and there was little questions on how it would work and I I watched <laughs> the two of you talk it through about the priorities and would it matter or would it not matter and and it was it was very nice to see and that was my first time that I met you and I got (laughs) such an instant good opinion of the both both of you together so that's awesome (laughs) thank you yeah and so what's ahead for you Ali I mean I'm world domination in Westfield New Jersey (laughs) number one (laughs) (laughs) Um, and what else anything else coming up other than continuing to do great work and building your little team and your your sphere of influence there well we've got a couple things in the works I'm still kind of um, I love the TV aspect of of what I do Um, being in front of the camera is fun and bringing Mm. design 
online kind of to the masses is fun. So I did recently film um, a proof of concept for a major network, um, which merges contracting and design. And it, it kind of, uh, it's an interesting concept. It's, you know, the original idea is that a, a, a family or a homeowner goes down the road with a project with a contractor and it goes awry for whatever reason. And so my contracting partner and I come in and we fix it up for them. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Isn't that crazy? I had no idea that that was the concept of this new thing that you're doing. And that's exactly what we just spent 20 minutes talking about. That's but bizarre. Case, uh... That was like a plan. I didn't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just that it's so relevant and right? that just speaks to it. So let's just hope that the network loves it. <laughs> yes. That's what happens. That's but it, awesome. It's though. Um, but other than that, you know, we are working, my, Mike and I are working on a brand new construction project, a home, which is directly next to our current home here in Westfield. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we are actually moving there. And it's a, it's a new concept for us. It's, it's a new build, which we typically only do whole home renovations and major additions. Mm -hmm. Um but it's new construction and it's completely custom. So it's not kind of your typical new construction, which, you know, I'm not going to say there's anything wrong with that. There's a lot of it right now and a lot of spec homes. Um, and we just felt like there's a niche for people who want brand new homes, new construction, but don't kind of want that cookie cutter feel, mm. which no matter how hard you try to customize the finishes, I still don't feel that that's a custom home and neither did Mike. So we we're doing this project right next door and it's fully custom from the ground up. It's we're getting to try out all these cool new techniques and ideas and concepts and, and design ideas, um, on ourselves first. So we're trying it out. Um, lots of interesting things like windows that go all the way basically to the ground, um, like a returned corner bead around our windows and doors to give kind of an old world feel, leaded glass windows, um, lots of different wood finishes and metal work. So we're trying to use like lots of old materials kind of in new ways um, to give it kind of a more modern updated feel. Um, and we're using that kind of as uh, like a, I don't know what you'd call it, basically like a show house. I was just going to say like a show house, basically. Yeah, yes. to kind of propel our business to the next level, um, working as a team for clients doing this kind of custom home building. And I am documenting the entire thing on Instagram. Wow. <laughs> it's like hashtag Shadow Lawn Drive. Um, and the response has been so unbelievable. We actually have signed our first contract to do another one of these custom construction homes right here in Westfield for a client who wasn't even thinking about moving wow. <laughs> they wanted to maybe do some design work on their beautiful home, which is gorgeous. Um, but they just loved what we were doing together. Um, they liked the collaboration. We kind of helped them find this little plot of land and now we're building from the ground up for them. Oh, for crying out loud. That's <laughs> amazing. So there's your concept. It, it totally worked. It's, Worth it's working. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's awesome. And then, so when you, you, when you're completed, you, you and your family will move into this home and then the home that's next door, will you sell it as is, or will you then renovate it up to the standards of what your, most of your work is? So, I mean, that home is beautiful, by the way. That's the one I was you. in. I mean, that yes. doesn't, I mean, I'm saying it, but I just know <laughs> the difference between what you're doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but actually, um, we did something similar to this home eight years ago when we bought it. We did a full gut renovation, right, added yeah. on about 2,000 square feet, um, and we put the home on the market, and it sold immediately, which I'm very I'm thankful for. And it's to a local Westfield family <laughs> <laughs> who has seen our work and was just – they actually, believe it or not – live in a new construction home that they built four years ago around the corner from here oh. and admired our work and this home so much that they're moving. <laughs> That's amazing, Ellie. Um, I'm, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> you are you. living and breathing everything that you say and you think and you do. You're, you're doing it. It's amazing. Thank you. It, it really is. I just think it's so exciting. You are. You. I cannot. Oh, my God. <laughs> I always think in terms, this is so crazy. People think I'm morbid, but I, I often think of terms of what will your obituary say about you? That's because right. I think it keeps you very clear. Like for me, if, I, 
it keeps me where I want to be, which is in my integrity and my honesty. That's like very important to me. And I always think, well, what's Daryl Bick going to say about you, Luann? Like you are that <laughs> crazy lady in Livingston that everybody hated because their business like took advantage of everybody. Or are you going to be that lady that they're, you know what I mean? And so yep. I'm thinking about, you know, a hundred years from now, your obituary with you and your husband. And it's going to be so amazing what you're contributing to this community. Thank you. Well, did you read that little thing on my Instagram last week? No. I, I posted a quote that said, the goal isn't to live forever. The goal is to create something that will. Oh, see, that's exactly <laughs> it. Except I am not as that nearly as eloquent. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write that. I actually can't figure out who did, but I posted it there. <laughs> that's terrific. That's it. And you're that's doing it. That's exactly what I'm saying. You're doing what you want to do you you have an ideal for yourself and your business and your relationship and your lifestyle and you are living in it that takes a lot of courage ellie it takes a lot of courage to not say well i really only want to do work here and i only want to do this kind of thing but i'll just do that one i, I it takes a tremendous amount of self-awareness and um confidence and good for you good thank for you. you i'm so psyched for you <laughs> Thanks. Oh, it's awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough for sharing your inspiration, your energy with us. Your, you know, really, it's it's just so fun to actually have time to talk with you like this, as opposed to over draperies. But I love that too. So <laughs> right back at you. <laughs> oh, thanks again, Ellie. Have a great day. Thanks, Luann. I love the way Ellie thinks. I love that she understands that she's going to do something her way because she has arrived at it through doing it other ways and it not being successful, but that she explains in detail how and why it works for not only her, but for her client. And then she also makes sure that she has the conversation before the contract is signed. All right. And the thing about this is that it says to us how Ellie decides how she will operate her design firm and how she sets the tone. Okay. And then as far as how about the conflicts with trades? I mean, love this perspective, right? No drama zone, no making things worse by complaining. And like she said, definitely no playing it out in front of your client. If you have a problem with a trade, talk to them together, figure out why the problem happened, how it could have been avoided. And most importantly, figure out the, be the best resolution, one that serves your client, you, your trade, and the vision for the project. I love her analogy about not arguing in front of the kids, right? For all of us who are parents, we get that. You need to respect all parties, the client, the trade, and the design. If you can do that, you'll be fine. And then the other really important advice is about how to avoid conflicts altogether, right? Ellie said, making sure that you do multiple site visits. Take the time to walk the job regularly with your own internal team, with your trades, and with your client. Always being proactive, always looking for the details that could slip through the cracks. That's great advice. All right, so follow Ellie on Instagram, Ellie Rose Design. It's E-L-L-I-E-M-R-O-Z design. And then look for that hashtag shadow long drive. And you'll be able to watch as she and her husband create this exceptional home. And you'll probably get a peek at a few of the window treatments that we're doing for her there too. And then follow us on wind on uh, Instagram too. First you have me at Luann Nigara, but also follow window works on Instagram. Some people recently asked me what window works was. And I mean, designers that I met. I I don't know if it was at High Point or an event here in the city, but they were like, what is Window Works? <laughs> and I thought, how do you not know that? And so it made me realize that I don't explicitly express it often enough on the show. So I'm going to take a minute. My primary business is Window Works. We are located in Livingston, New Jersey. We have been in business, my husband, Vince, myself, and our cousin, Bill, since 1982. And we specialize in custom window treatments and awnings. We work with many of the area interior designers that have been on this show and many that, um, you know, have not been on the show yet, but we'll probably get to them. So we have Ellie Morose, we have Jenny Madden, we have House of Funk, Charles Pavarini, Ursino Interiors. 
colors, Gail Davis designs, decorated interiors, beam and bloom. I mean, okay, I just made a big mistake here <laughs> because I should have just mentioned one or two. Then when the 20 others were left out, nobody would think anything of it. Um, but I better stop before I get myself into trouble. Suffice it to say, if you are a new interior designer and you are in the New York, New Jersey area, or you are from out of town and have a project in the New York, New Jersey area, and you need help navigating window treatments and awnings for your project, you can call on us. We'll help you walk through that and help you understand how to um, approach the project, how to price the project, and how to present the project. And I'm going to tell you, if you're a seasoned pro, please call on us as, as well. I mean, we have, like I said, Charles Paverini and House of Funk. These are designers that have been in business for many, many years, and they are at the top of the luxury game here, here in the New York City market. And uh, we, if you need a boots on the ground vendor here in the New York, New Jersey area for window treatments or awnings, we are here to help you make your your designs come to life. All right. Thank you tons for joining me today. I hope by now it's a part of the show right now where you're start to starting to think about what will you do today? What will you do today to create excellence in your interior design firm? How will you decide to be excellent? Let me know. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one -on -one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.